This next speaker knew that Skepticon would be great before we knew that Skepticon would be great because she sent us stuff and we didn't know who she was. We were like, someone sent us a box. Oh my God. And there was like a tons of cool flyers in there about free thinking and activism. And we're just so happy to have you here. Everyone give it up for Debbie Goddard. The title slide is important. That's all right. That just whoa. <laughs> it's just a title slide. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I can slide the so if I need be. I'm glad to see so many of you so early in the morning here in Springfield at Skepticon. Thanks for coming out to the talk. Uh, I'll admit something. I wasn't sure what to talk about here. Yeah, but it's going to be that. <laughs> OK, I think that's in focus too, right? Yeah, OK, good. Um, I was thinking about speaking about African Americans for Humanism, which is one of the programs that I help run at the Center for Inquiry. But Monica Miller did such an excellent job yesterday covering a lot of the things that I was thinking about and in a much better, <laughs> more interesting way than I would have ever approached them that I decided instead uh, to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the student movement and some of the young activists around the world and what they're up to. And I have three sections of this presentation that I've smashed together. I'm going to try to get through with them all. I think the end part is the most interesting, maybe? So I'll try to go quickly. I'm challenging myself here. So my name is Debbie. I work at the Center for Inquiry headquarters in Amherst. I've been working there for seven years. Um, but I've actually been involved with things much longer than that. So I thought I'd tell, uh, start by telling you my personal story some uh, to help frame why I got involved in this movement and why my interests lay where they do when it comes to the activism that I'm engaged in the organizing that I get to do, why some things are so exciting when I come across them. And apologies to the three of you who might have heard some of this already, though I think most of them are gone. Yeah. I was born in Philadelphia <laughs> on a rainy Wednesday, 1.38 in the afternoon. Uh, I grew up in a rough part of the city. Um, and for those reasons, my parents decided, because the local public schools were so terrible, um, they decided to send my siblings and me to Catholic school. My mom was culturally Catholic. She's from Trinidad originally, so it wasn't really a big deal to her, just mostly what she was familiar with. My dad was Jewish. And so sometimes growing up, I'd go to synagogue with him, but mostly I was used to the kind of Catholic theological framework. That's what we learned in religion class, and I'd have to go to church all the time. In sixth and seventh grade, uh, the sixth and seventh graders would go through the sacrament of confirmation. And when it came time for me to do so, I wasn't sure that I wanted to. Partly because I had just realized that if the Catholics were right about everything, that the Jews were wrong. And before that, I'd kind of thought, you know, they all worship the same God, they just have this culture, that culture, they do it differently. But when I thought about engaging in the sacrament of confirmation and how it's like a lifetime commitment to be Catholic forever, I thought. I took this very, very seriously, right? And what if I was wrong? 
that I was stuck, I thought, as a sixth grader, being Catholic forever. Yet I was wrong, right? So this really was a struggle for me, that if the Catholics were right, my dad was wrong, the people at synagogue were wrong. But if the Jews were right, then everything I'm learning in Catholic school is wrong. So I thought I might be able to forestall confirmation, which everyone in my grade was doing. And I told my teacher in sixth grade, Sister Therese, Sister Therese, can I wait two years and do it in eighth grade? And she said, no, nope, everyone's doing it except the one Baptist girl in my school. Uh, so no, you're going to go through with it. And she was kind of boggled, like, no, you're, it's, that's what you're doing. That's what we do in religion class in sixth grade. And I was kind of shocked by this. like. But, 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 but what if I'm wrong? I'm too young, I can't decide yet, plus all my sins will count against me. So I thought I could get out of it because there was the one Baptist girl in my class. I thought I could get out of it if I converted to, to Judaism. So I told my dad, Dad, I want to be Jewish. Don't tell mom. <laughs> and he said, that's great. We'll talk to Rabbi Greenberg at Knesset Israel, and you can start training for your bat mitzvah. <laughs> so I thought these were my two options. Either I could get confirmed and be Catholic forever, or I could go and get a bat mitzvah and be Jewish forever. That was it. And this was very serious to me. If I picked one, I was wrong. I was stuck. I had made this commitment. So one Sunday, I was nervous about this because I had to choose a sponsor for a confirmation, someone, an older Catholic person, more experienced, who guides you through the process. And I was the only person left in my class who hadn't. And I thought, I either have to commit this way or that way. So I'm riding around on my bike. Outside, I lean against a fence, and I'm imagining in my head, is it this kind of God or that kind of God? Because I knew they were different. And in my head, Catholic God was kind of the sunbeam through the clouds God, right? And Jewish God was kind of like the Moses God, like the long white beard old guy. And I'm imagining, well, Catholic God sent Jesus, his son, as the Messiah, who's also God. And Jewish God, according to what I know, they're still waiting for the Messiah. And these were irreconcilable. But if, what are the Jews waiting for? Well, they said if the Messiah comes, there's gonna be a thousand years of peace. Well, that didn't happen. So maybe they're right, but then again, if they're wrong, they're going to burn in hell forever. But if they're right, then they're the chosen people, but what about everyone else? This was like, you know, I'm in sixth grade. I don't know how to think about these things, really. It's just like, ah, oh, I, I don't know. And as I'm sitting there, a uh, Hindu walks past. And I think, what if they're right? Oh, there's no way they're right. They believe in blue elephant-headed multi-armed gods. That's silly. That's, <laughs> no way. That's just like Greek mythology. Wait. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, the Greeks, I think, were pretty convinced that they were right. And we had a big book of Greek mythology in class, and so I'd read that sometime, and I thought, you know, they worshiped these kinds of gods. No one thinks that that's true now. What if 2,000 years from now, everyone's worshiping Aslan? <laughs> and referencing these kind of obscure books, books that relate to each other, and then they say, look, there's prophecies. I was really into the Chronicles of Narnia at the time, and thank you, C.S. Lewis, for helping make me an atheist. But, <laughs> right? And it made sense. I was really into Aslan. I didn't see any of the, the Christian mythology within the books at all because that was just kind of my cultural understanding. And I thought, you know, that I, I see that it's totally possible that 2,000 years from now we'll all be worshiping Aslan and the Jesus stories won't make sense to anyone. They'll say, well, that's what they worshiped back then. Why are there so many stories? What if there's so many stories because, like, who's right? Well, maybe there is no God. And I, I have said before that to me this was the definition of an eye-opening experience. I felt like in one moment I was weighing these concepts, what kind of God is there? And the second, it was this flash of there is no God. There was no God in the tree. There was no God in the sidewalk. The world was a different place and it made sense. And I thought I was the first person ever to think about this. <laughs> 
I was so excited to tell people. <laughs> and here's how I imagined it would play out. And if you've seen The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, I think as a child, I didn't have a lot of friends, and that was a lot of how I thought about how things might happen. That in my head, I bike home, and as I'm biking home, I'm thinking, I'm going to tell Sister Therese. And Sister Therese will say, wow, I didn't think of that. And <laughs> wow, what an idea, Debbie. And then she'll have to go back to the convent, and the nuns will be talking about this over spaghetti dinner. And they're like, yeah, just she brought this along. Maybe there's, maybe there's their stories. And it'll be too much for them, and so they'll have to bring it to the priests. And then the priests are waiting around like, mm, this is it. And it'll go up the ladder to the monsignors and whatever. And then next thing would be on Time Magazine. <laughs> maybe there is no God. Debbie Goddard, sixth grader, Philadelphia, PA, came up with this idea. <laughs> Because <laughs> it seemed like such a big idea, and I'd never heard anyone even present this as a possibility before. This is why I thought maybe this was entirely new. And so my parents weren't home, so I couldn't share the good news with them. But I went to class the next day, and at recess, my teacher pulled me aside and asked me, so who did you choose as your sponsor, Debbie? You're the last one who hasn't. I said, and at, in seven, at sixth grade, I was about five, seven and a half, so I'm looking down at her, and I say, <laughs> Sister Therese, I don't think there is a God. <laughs> and in my head, like, what the next thing would happen to be would be very exciting. <laughs> it wasn't as it's exciting. Uh, she wasn't as thrilled by this revelation as I had been. Instead, I got in trouble. You know, kind of the, what? You listen to me, young lady, kind of thing. And I got suspended for two days put in another part of the building with a Bible and my spelling homework for two days by myself, which gave me a lot of opportunity to read the Bible with these new eyes and realize <laughs> that these are really just stories, like Greek mythology, especially the wacky ones, you know? That they're lessons, morality lessons, like Aesop's fables or something. Interestingly, I still went through the sacrament of confirmation. Because I, I told my mom, you know, I got in trouble, she wasn't so pleased with that. So I said, well, I don't, I don't want to do this, mom. I don't think there is a God. And my mom's pretty cool. Uh, she was in nursing school, she was taking philosophy courses. And she said, well, you know, what? And so I explained to her and I said, I don't want to do the sacrament and promise that I'm gonna be Catholic forever if I don't think there's a God. So I don't want to do it. And she's like, if you don't believe in God, then you're not making a promise to anyone. So just go through with it and don't worry about it. Just don't get in trouble. And I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think of that. <laughs> OK, I, I will. So I you know, went through all the religion class because it was our focus for months. I missed the catechism. I didn't meet with the priests and get uh, answer questions about Catholicism because my mom graduated from nursing school that day. So I missed school, never made it up. Uh, they assigned me the school secretary, Sister Charles, for my sponsor, and uh, she was my older sister's sponsor as well. So, yeah, went through that. Uh, the bishop, who was 89 at the time, you know, you walk up to him, my sponsor's hand was on my shoulder, and the bishop says, do you want, believe in the one true Catholic God? And I said, no. <laughs> and he was deaf, so he blessed me, <laughs> continue on. <laughs> And I did, kind of, you know, but also terrified, right? My, however, Sister Charles was not deaf and heard me um, and gripped up my shoulder on the way back to the pew and said, we'll talk about this later, young lady. I was scared of Sister Charles. So I tried to avoid her office for months after that. Walking out, I'd kind of walk past other lines and make sure I couldn't, couldn't be seen, couldn't get called in and yelled at. Well, eventually, a year and a half later in eighth grade, I won a scholarship to a Catholic private all-girls school, which was a big deal because my older sister had won the same scholarship and I couldn't go to the school unless I had gotten a scholarship. And again, my local high school is rough. I think our graduation rate at the time was like 39% or 42% metal detectors and everything. So this was a big deal that I could go to this fancy private all-girls academy in the suburbs. And people were congratulating, good job, Debbie, this is great. I got called down to the office in school 
thinking, you know, this principal's gonna see me and this is gonna be fantastic. But no, it was Sister Charles who said to me, I remember what you said at confirmation, and I know that you haven't been going to church. I'm going to tell the nuns at the other school, it was the same nuns, the Sisters of St. Joseph, and they're going to take your scholarship away. And I said, no, 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 I go to church, I just go to the church in my neighborhood. And she said, bring me a note from the priest that says you do. And I said, he never sees me, I sit in the back. And <laughs> she glared at me and I thought, no, no, I do, I'll start going to this church. So I started going to church, taking the bus sometimes so that I could be seen as someone who's going to church, so I wouldn't lose my scholarship, so I could still go to the school for months. And it was so boring. So that gave me a lot of things to think about that I wanted to talk to other people about. So when I got to high school, I started a philosophy club. Ran that for a while. Now, I didn't know anything about philosophy. This is 1994, so the internet's not really big yet. I had encyclopedias that I would reference for some topics, but most of the time we talk about things like, do Vulcans have souls? <laughs> if Jesus never visits them, or are they kind of treated like cats and dogs in, in Catholic theology? And other topics, so I was really proud of, you know, what's the relationship between morality and legality? I thought I was clever for coming up with that. So I uh, did that for a while, had about six to eight people who were involved steadily, sometimes some bigger topics we'd address. A year and a half in, halfway through my sophomore year, I got in trouble, happens. Um, we had to write a paper in religion class on a priestly person. And a priestly person is someone who takes Catholic values and ministers to the masses the way that a priest ministers to a congregation. And so people picked people like the Pope, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and mine was on Bob Dylan. <laughs> and I, I justified it in seven pages with a bibliography. Most people didn't. It, they, it was only supposed to be four, or double spaced. And I meant it. I played guitar, I play guitar t still, uh, mostly 60s protest folk, and I was inspired by Bob Dylan as an agent of social change. And I loved that phrase, I had just learned it, so agent of social change. And I talked about how he converted religions three times, but also how songs like Hurricane led directly, in the, my telling, to the freeing of Reuben Carter from prison, how songs like Blown in the Wind and others raised consciousness and had this impact on culture. It might have been a little overblown, but so were the biographies I was reading. Um, and I got in trouble for that. I got called out of class. Uh, Sister Mary Hummel, my religion teacher at the time, kind of held the paper up. What is the meaning of this? And I said, Bob Dylan was an agent of social change. And she said, he was a rock musician. And I said, well, that way he was able to get his message out to more people. She says, he was a Jew. <laughs> and I was taken aback and said, well, Martin Luther King wasn't Catholic either. And neither was Gandhi. And she stormed off down the hall. <laughs> And I was left kind of standing outside of the classroom in the hallway. Um, everyone heard it in the classroom and I had to kind of slink back in. And she came back about 10 minutes later after they called my parents. <laughs> and this is in January of sophomore year. They called my parents, they had a meeting, and they told my parents they were taking my scholarship away. That paper was one of the examples they gave. The philosophy club was another example that the questions that we discussed in philosophy club showed them that I wasn't growing up to be a good young Catholic woman, which is what the scholarships were designed to foster. And so halfway through sophomore year, I realized, like I was told I wasn't coming back the next year, that I was gonna have to go to a different school from all of my friends, that I got in trouble for asking questions and addressing ideas. So when I went to public school in the fall, in the suburbs, fortunately, because my parents, we moved up to the burbs 10 minutes north, um, I started another philosophy club. But I was a lot angrier. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked a lot more about atheism, which was a word I'd learned by then in eighth grade, actually, in my religion book. Um, it wasn't the focus of the club, but certainly we addressed ideas about religion very differently than I had before. And we still start, talked about Star Trek a lot and church-state separation, and academic freedom uh, ideas, and some international concepts too. Well, what I learned later was someone in my philosophy club, a friend of mine who I had convinced to join, was kind of nominally Christian. Because of the discussions we had, she became an atheist, a non-believer. And she ended up getting very into this. And when she went to college at the University of Pittsburgh, 
this is 1999 for her, she started a campus group, Campus Free Thought Alliance group, which was, I'll tell you more about that history, but she started this group, um, plugged into this national movement that I had no idea even existed, and gave me a call one day in the summer and said, I'm going to this conference for students at a secular humanist organization near Buffalo, do you wanna go? And I said, a what? <laughs> a secular, I don't know, what's that? And she said, it's basically a student atheist convention. And I was like, what? They meet? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what? that's a thing, sure. So in the summer of 2000, I called up, they gave me a travel grant, my friend Danielle and I got on the Greyhound bus from Philadelphia to Buffalo, thinking that there were gonna be maybe 20 students in a VFW somewhere for several days. Shocked when we were picked up in a vehicle that said Center for Inquiry on the side. CFI Mobile, we call it. And driven out to a building with paid staff, with the library, with books, with magazines of people who are committed to promoting critical thinking and naturalism. I had no idea that there was anything like that out there. And the reason I was studying philosophy was because I wanted to promote critical thinking and free inquiry, no questions off limits. So the fact that there was a movement and there were organizations that were doing this, just, I was gonna be doing this too, hopefully, I thought. Like, this is where I'm gonna spend my activism energies. So when I, it was, by the way, a blast, and I got to meet amazing people there. Um, when I got back to Philly, I joined every free thought and skeptic group I could in 100 miles, which included a lot of groups in New York City. I would drive to things in North Jersey, 89 miles away, drive to York, PA, 100 miles west of me, because I was so excited to find out that there was a movement like this. In 2001, I started volunteering for CFI's campus outreach program as publications director, which was a fantastic opportunity for me to learn not only what was going on in other campuses elsewhere, but also around the world. And also a lot of the issues that were coming up in the time. At the conference for the first time, I learned about this network of campus groups out there. And I connected especially with the Ohio State University students and a group in uh, Georgia. And learned that they were doing campaigns and education programs and bringing in big speakers that I'd never heard of because I was new to everything and really making a difference on their campuses. So I started a group on my campus when I got back, which was community college at the time. I tried to start a group later at Temple University because I knew now that I could. And I sent emails to some of these new people I met and later used Friendster <laughs> to, to talk about like, oh, well, we have this protest group coming. What have you done? And they're like, oh, well, we didn't deal with them, but we learned about this group in Minnesota that did these things. Try this. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is great. So it also provided a support system for me um, and idea sharing. That was the point of the network. It was fantastic, but I don't want, just want to talk about my experience with that. Um, I'd like to tell you about some of the other people who were involved back then and what they get to do now. Check the time. I said, so I mentioned I got involved in 2000. Uh, the campus program at CFI had actually started in 1996 as the Campus Free Thought Alliance. When seven students got together in Amherst, New York, um, at CFI headquarters, they already had groups on their campuses back then, and some of, some of the groups that are out there have existed for a few decades, uh, including the University of Minnesota group, which PZ Myers is the faculty advisor for. I think they've been around for more than 20 years, but I don't know how long exactly. Uh, they got together because they wanted to communicate with each other and share resources and share ideas. So they launched the Campus Free Thought Alliance with a declaration of necessity, which actually made a lot of press at the time. It was in the New York Times, for example. They wanted to be able to address not only what they saw as the rising tide of religious fundamentalism and uh, anti-academic freedom attitudes on campuses, but also, at least in their opening language at the time, the postmodern left, uh, that all ideas are fine and we have no, like, no platform to stand on to criticize anyone's cultural practices. And they said, yeah, we can actually do that from humanism. So I, I learned a lot. Um, I thought there were people who got involved earlier than I did. I'll tell you about some of them. My role, um, Oh, 
That's not a slide. Uh oh. Yeah, I think the I think the projector has uh, not it stopped recognizing the computer signal. Blam. That's me. Um, different things I did back then. Publications director, so I had to edit the bear of a newsletter. Uh, these were some of the students in the conference. I know now that you can't very much see that. There's a picture of students here. Uh, <laughs> this is back in uh, 2001, actually. Uh, people including some of the speakers who were at that conference were the infidel guy. I know I met August Brunsman back in 2000. He's now the executive director of the Secular Student Alliance, which started as an independent student organization in 2000. So I got involved just as they were launching. Um, and there's some other people who ended up working for being involved in movement um, in that image that you can't. This is actually a picture heavy presentation, so this, this might be tricky. But yeah, we'll do the best we can. Oh no. Let me see if I can get this better. Haha, -ha, see if I. I think it's fine. I just lost my screw, and there's this platform here, but it's cool. I think I got it. I'll just try not to touch things too much. Cool. This is from a conference in 2001, uh, my first national conference. I drove with a friend who's actually in that corner from Atlanta overnight from Philadelphia, which is quite a drive, but I'm sure some of you have had to do that to get to this conference, too. Uh, I met a lot of great people at this conference, including some international leaders and, yeah, students from all over the place. This is, you can't see me there too well, but I was on a building tour at CFI. Ed Buckner at the time, who later became the president of American Atheists, was at the time the Council for Secular Humanism Executive Director. This is from 2002. Uh, we were at the Godless Americans March on Washington. How many of you have heard of that? Not too many. It was kind of Reason Rally, but 10 years earlier. And one of the great things about that is at that, which was a big event for us, we had estimates were between 1,700 and 2,300 people. 10 years later with the Reason Rally, 25,000, right? So, but our small group at the time, we were <laughs> pretty excited. Cool to measure the growth of the movement like that. From my activism and the fact that I was at basically every event on the East Coast that I could attend, I got profiled on BeliefNet in 2002 as the student activist, as president of the Campus Free Thought Alliance at the time, which was bizarre because there were some really amazing leaders in this list, and I was like, I don't, I don't belong with these people. All I'm doing is helping these groups in this region of the country, but. Cool. And I couldn't show my coworkers at the time, by the way, because I worked with a lot of uh, religious right wing Republican types. So just quiet about that. Oh, so let me go on to some of the others. Uh, Derek Arujo was the founding president of the Campus Free Thought Alliance, also founded the Harvard Secular Society back in 1996. Uh, had some different roles in the movement. Uh, is, actually quit things a couple of years ago to go to MIT for a physics PhD. Chris Mooney is another person who got involved with the movement as a student leader. I think in 98, he predated me a little bit, but I think 98 to 2000, he worked in, as a Campus Free Thought Alliance volunteer and intern. He was on the executive council as publications director, or sorry, uh, PR coordinator. So it was his job to send out press releases to different people. And I've talked to him about this before. He credits his time as a student volunteer with inspiring him to become a science communicator and science journalist. He now has four New York Times bestselling books out there addressing you know, the war on science uh, and the effects that denying science have on the world. Austin Klein. How many of you have heard of Austin Klein? Just a few. All right. Austin Klein is the about.com 
atheism guide. If you ever stumble across some of the many, 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 many articles on about.com, you've seen his face, especially because he's used that headshot since at least 2000. <laughs> Who knows how he looks now? I, I don't. This, hopefully, maybe. He uses a cat picture on Twitter, actually. If, you, if this looks familiar to you, it's Austin Klein, former student leader involved with the Campus Freethaw Alliance in the 90s. Micah White is an interesting one. I met him in 2000, and we became friends for a while. He actually ended up going to Swarthmore uh, outside of Philadelphia. He founded a high school atheist club after a lot of pushback in Michigan. The ACLU had to be involved. That was in the New York Times. He actually wrote a long op-ed about it. After his time at Swarthmore, he got involved in some progressive and lefty politics, uh, was a part of Adbusters, is a part of Adbusters now, and is one of two architects of the Occupy movement, which I'm sure all of you have heard of, right? Yeah, Micah White, former high school atheist activist, is one of the people behind that, writing for The Guardian and other sources. I mentioned August Brunsbin, who I also had the chance to meet in 2000. He is now the executive director of the SSA, has had a large part in its successes recently, started as the Internet Affairs Coordinator, I think, for the Campus Free Thought Lines back in the late 90s. Jason Torpy from the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers, intern at CFI in 2000. Stayed up late with him. That's going to be in video, isn't it? <laughs> Stayed up late with him, <laughs> having great conversations and uh, good times back in Amherst when I was first getting involved. Um, now he's president of the organization. Maggie Ardiente from the uh, James Madison Freethinkers uh, was involved with the SSA board. She currently works for the American Humanist Association as director of development and communications. Hemant, you know, I don't have to say much about him, but uh, was working with the student group in Chicago, also interned at CFI back in 2000. I thought it was 2003. He says 2002. I think I'm right. But 10-ish <laughs> years ago, uh, he was an intern at CFI and got involved with the Secular Student Alliance and Foundation Beyond Belief. JT, again, someone I don't need to say anything about. And I could go on and on about the amazing job that a student group has done here to make Skepticon happen, now recent students uh, and friends. But I don't need to tell you all about that. You're evidence of that, right? Sid LeRoy, who is uh, the CFI Executive Director in New York City, got involved as a student leader, founded four groups across New York City, uh, has just been profiled in Newsweek with uh, some other volunteer leaders in New York City who created a group for ex-Christians under 30. If you read this Newsweek article, it's kind of heartbreaking, the, the kinds of things, the issues that some of the young people have brought to the meetings that now Sid is helping them organize together, meet, have a community there. Started as a student leader. Dave Moscato, now the PR director for American Atheists, was just here, had to head out earlier today, former president of the Missouri, University of Missouri, Sasha student group in Columbia. Also interned with SSA. And Sarah Kaiser, my colleague and coworker, she created the Secular Alliance of Indiana University back in 2008 and was inspired by a student leadership conference to do a bus campaign, Indiana Atheist Bus Campaign. They put bus ads up, I think in 2008, 2000, no, it must have been 2009, in Indiana and Chicago, um, saying, you can be good without God. I thought that this was amazing. Bus camp, the bus ads had just kind of started. Uh, there hadn't been giant billboard campaigns yet. Like in the last few years, there have been so many, but this is further ago than that. So when I was invited to speak at a conference about the student movement, I hosted a panel with four <coughs> leaders from different backgrounds who were engaged in activism. This was in Bethesda, Maryland in 2009. And Sarah Kaiser was one of the people that I picked to talk about the Indiana Atheist Bus Campaign and how she, as a student leader, was able to bring together a lot of different people um, to get, actually, physical ads on buses, including in Chicago. Uh, in the, on this panel, we also had, uh, on the other end, that Sarah there, 
Derek from Halifax. Next to him was Jason Ball, a wunderkind from Australia. Jason, I'll tell you about him for a moment. Jason Ball came to the US as a high school student on an exchange program for a year and lived with a family in Kansas. <laughs> he did not have any idea before then what, how pervasive religion can be in a small community in the middle of the US. And he was inspired by the experience when he went back to Australia to start a secular club at the University of Melbourne, which he makes me say that way, Melbourne. <laughs> uh, became a spokesperson uh, fighting for secularism in Australian government and Australian society. Ended up being the PR coordinator at 22 or 23, I think, for the Atheist Foundation of Australia. Created a network for campus groups across Australia where I think they have 29 universities they now have student groups at 22 of them in this network called the Free Thought Student Alliance. And one was, was one of the major organizers of the Global Atheist Convention, which I think is the world's largest atheist convention so far. They have had two so far, and their last one last year drew in 4,000 people. And that's him speaking at that event. He also has been a spokesperson uh, for well, he, he's a footy player. And Australians have cute versions of lots of words that, that we don't use. Uh, Australian rules football. He plays Australian rules football and he's gay and didn't, wasn't out of the closet about it at first because he was afraid of pushback in you know, semi-professional sports league. Eventually, not eventually, but at some point he just said to someone, hey, that's not cool that you use the, those words, I'm gay. It ended up being a very big thing. He ended up becoming a spokesperson for it. Other people came out. A lot of people supported him. And they ended up changing and adding to the rules to try to, to punish people, actually, if they used to engage in homophobic slurs during footy games and in the locker rooms. I, as a result, I know he was the Grand Marshal of the Melbourne Pride Parade, which is what that photo is from. He's been profiled in magazines. It's inspired a lot of particularly young people to stand up and have a voice. I wanted to talk some about some of the other amazing people that I've had the chance to meet over time and some of the stuff that they've been engaged in. I can't tell you everything about what they do, but I can tell you some of the things that I've learned about their work, and I've emailed some of them later for more information. And it's really inspired me. I hope I can share some of that inspiration with you. So this is Yemi. Yemi lives in Nigeria. Adamowo Adayemi Johnson. I first communicated with Yemi in 2001, when I became publications director. And part of my job was just finding content for a newsletter that had to go out monthly. I found out that we had campus affiliate groups in Nigeria. And I was a 21-year-old in the US. I knew nothing about Nigeria. Giraffes on the plains or something, that's, that's about what I thought. It's pretty awful. So I thought, what? We have campus groups there. What are they doing? This is great. I'm going to email this random email address I see and say, hello, my name is Debbie Goddard. I'm the publications director at the Campus Free Thought Alliance. Would you like to write an article about what your campus group is up to? I got this response from Yemi saying, wow, that's great that you're interested in what we're doing. We actually have this anti-superstition workshop coming up soon to try to educate people so that we can fight child witchcraft accusations. Because people are killing children who are accused of witchcraft here. That's so amazing that you want to hear about what we're doing. I'd be happy to write an article. What kinds of things are you doing in the United States? <laughs> and this is 2001, and uh, my response could have been, well, we're working really hard to get God out of the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> it floored me that college students, people my age, somewhere else, are trying to educate people so that they stop killing children who are accused of witchcraft, so they stop accusing children of witchcraft. Learning about this really expanded how I thought about what we're doing. 
But yeah, we emailed back and forth for a while, and then we went on Friendster later, and then MySpace, and then Facebook. <laughs> uh, but you know, didn't stay too closely in touch. Um, but I did end up having the opportunity to meet him in person later. In Oslo. In 2011, I got to go to the World Humanist Congress in Oslo as a CFI representative. My first time in a real foreign country, as in not Canada. <laughs> Somewhere else where it's not just, wow, things are in metric and French. Uh, I live in Buffalo, so Canada's like right across the water, you know, no big deal. Oslo, very different. And it was a World Humanist Congress, so it had people from all over the place. Uh, we learned about UN efforts. I learned about you know, what they're doing in India and Africa and South America and different parts of uh, Europe. But it was an interesting time to be there because it was two weeks after the terrorist attack from Breivik. And I hadn't really realized that. Just before I left for Oslo, I had a difficult move, I had uh, relationship bumps, I had uh, too much work to do, not enough time. So I hadn't really paid attention and pieced together that this huge news story had to do with the city I'd be traveling to. It turned out that the Congress Center, the big meeting hall we were in, was right off the square, a block from the bomb blast in downtown Oslo. So this is facing the fountain. If you saw on the news at the time, people were putting flowers in the fountain in the square. The blast occurred just on the other side of this building in front of the building with the white drape. Uh, there's a lot of windows with missing uh, glass where they have plywood up. And the Congress Center was on this side of the square. This is a picture of the broken clock face. Um, no, it's not. Imagine. There's a clock face there, it's broken. Aha. All right, this is at the Congress Center that says International Humanist and Ethical Union, World Humanist Congress, Oslo 2011. It says up the street, you see maybe windows missing and plywood everywhere. Down the street, the same. There's this juxtaposition of this effects of terrorism from a racist, <laughs> somewhat Christian-affiliated bad thinker while we were having a, con a conference on humanism and peace. But it's there that I met Yemi. And I didn't expect Yemi to come. We hadn't been in that close contact. And one day I hear my name shouted across the hall and a big hug from someone. And I went, Yemi? Wow. We ended up having so many great discussions. It was neat to connect with someone that I'd connected with first 10 years previously online when we were both 21, 22 year olds working on our different campuses in completely different parts of the world. The other two in this picture were uh, organizers from Nepal. And I asked him for an update on his activities and he was happy to share. He's finishing up a PhD now, uh, has written a couple of books, including one called Suffer Not a Witch to Live. And he's made this interest of his into a big part of his work. He sent me some articles that he's dealing with there. Um, this one says, man plucks 10-year-old boy's eyes for ritual. Another one, uh, this is an article, why some Nigerians carry out ritual killings. To come at this, he started an organization, a couple of different organizations actually, and gives presentations, um, does anti-superstition workshops tries to uh, fight against some of the preachers who are advancing the idea that there can be spirits that possess your children, that cause illness in your family and whatnot. This is the picture of the Young Humanistas Network uh, presentation he's doing. And he sent me one story about, uh, this was touching, one of the workshops that they did somewhere when they went outside later, there was a kid begging for food and they talked to him and found out that a couple months ago, it seemed, though the kid's timeline recollection was a little fuzzy, he was accused of witchcraft. And his parents attacked him, tied him outside for a while, wouldn't feed him until he escaped and ran away. Now he was begging on the street. So they connected him with one of a series of orphanages that they've built just for this where they do education programs for these children who have been accused of witchcraft. 
That's one thing that a young activist somewhere has been engaged in in a different part of the world that I was and am quite inspired by. Another young activist I met, this is uh, Betty Nasaka. She's from Uganda and helped create an organization called the Ugandan Humanist Effort to Save Women. Women. The mission statement is to promote humanistic values of human rights, social welfare, and scientific rationalism among vulnerable groups of young women. I won't read all of these objectives, but just know it's empowering young women, I'll do the first, to become skeptical, rational, free, and critical thinkers. The fourth of the objectives is to contribute to the eradication of poverty amongst women. And this is what they see as their humanist mission ways that they can advance humanism. So what they do is educate, actually largely it's prostitutes and former prostitutes, girls and young women, by teaching them, uh, giving them education, job skills, this is sewing classes, this is hair braiding class, uh, these are high school equivalency classes so that they have other options, they have alternatives. There's so much that I could say about each of these people, but I know there's a limited amount of time, so I apologize that I'm going through this more quickly than I would love to, because I could tell stories about some of their amazing work all day. Um, this is George Ongare. He actually is the executive director of CFI Kenya. I think he's 29. And the book that he's holding here is one that we gave him a grant to publish. We have a campus organizing manual. The SSA has a similar one. Um, and he took that and translated it into something that would make more sense in an African context. Instead of referencing Jefferson and Madison and Voltaire and the Enlightenment, he put in stories that would resonate more with the population he's working with. right? Uh, African mythology, Kenyan history, African thinkers, literature, uh, published these, and now there are four campus groups in Kenya. We just got our fourth campus group relatively rec recently at Maseno University. They do science trips because there are a lot of Kenyans, one of the issues that he's facing is there's a distrust of science, uh, as we see too in the different communities in the U.S., of course. Uh, this is one of the campus groups, the University of Nairobi Humanists and Freethinkers, that he helped create. Let's move to a different continent now. This is someone that I had the opportunity to meet in Oslo, named Abalash, at the Atheist Center. He works at the Atheist Center in India. Interesting place. I didn't lose it, no. They're, what they mean by atheism is promoting humanism and skepticism. And one of the projects that they do is bring in magicians for a half-day workshop so that they can go out and teach villagers how magic tricks work so that the next time a godman comes by showing that he can generate a necklace out of thin air, or that he can stick a nail through his tongue because of his powers and wants money so that he can give them healing, healing necklaces and whatnot, they can say, no, we know how that's done. That's just a magic trick. This is what they see as part of their atheism. They also fight caste system discrimination. Uh, they help do contraceptive education for women. And this is all part of their atheism and skepticism and humanism. It's kind of one package for them an article about the magic camp. Another Indian activist who I think you've heard of uh, is Sanal Adamaruku. Yeah. Now he's not as young as some of the other people I've shown up. I think Abalash is only 29 as well. Um, I think he's in his early 40s, I'm not even sure. But he actually started as a student activist, created a rationalist group at his university. And he's doing amazing stuff now. Uh, two things that you may have heard of, one is uh, on TV, in 2008, he was challenged by a godman that the godman could kill anyone with powers of his mind. And he's like, yeah, try it. <laughs> and they had a show where the godman had some length of time. He wasn't supposed to have any contact with him, but as you see, the guy tried. 
Meanwhile, Sonala's kind of laughing <laughs> at him, like, yeah, keep trying, do your chance to try to kill me with your mind powers. It didn't work. And it was so popular that it actually bumped programming for hours while the godman tried and tried and tried until he was blue in the face, right? <laughs> they got so much view of this. Think of the impact that that had. This disturbing image, sorry, <laughs> is from another godman that he fought successfully. A guy who would come to villages and say that he had magic powers basically in his legs. That if he stood on your infants, it would give them health. So now I'll challenge this um, out to people. And I took a clip from a newspaper article about it. The parliament member from this area, a minister and a top priest, defend the ritual in the name of religion and tradition. Sanal did a TV interview about this, and two days later, the godman was arrested, and this ritual ended. This is, this is their skeptical activism, right? Fighting superstition, educating people. The last person I'll mention is Gulalai Ismail from Pakistan. She started an organization in Pakistan, and she's a humanist, an atheist, although she's not a public atheist in Pakistan. When she was 16, she started an organization called Aware Girls. Because as you've seen, has gotten recent uh, media attention with Malala, many girls can't be educated in Pakistan. And even if they are, there are things that aren't in their curricula. She teaches them, first she defends their right to education, teaches them humanist values, and also things like sex education. So a young women-led organization working for women empowerment, gender equality, and, pa and peace in Pakistan, working to strengthen the leadership capacity of young women, enabling them to act as agents of social change and women empowerment in their communities. These are some of her students uh, with the poster they made in sex ed about spread of HIV and AIDS. So I learned a lot of things from the people I've met over time, not just other organizers, of course, and other activists and leaders, people involved with in the US, but I've had the opportunity to communicate with and actually meet some amazing young activists from around the world, which have helped to inform my perspectives on what skepticism is, what humanism is, what atheism is, what we mean by these, the fact that we can make these relevant in any cultural context, but also that we can't just necessarily export what works for us, what worked for me in Philadelphia, to a different part of the country or to a different culture in a different country. A lot of the efforts led, connected to humanism and skepticism are led by young people. I also learned, of course, that education is one of the keys to change in these cultures that you give people education and they change their area, right? Also, of course, that skepticism, humanism, free thought can be so inspiring. And I wanted to tell you about some of this, hoping that you would also be inspired by some of the examples of amazing young people around the world and what they're doing. I mean, this isn't just a talk for young people to inspire you, hopefully, to go out and make change occur, but to every one of us. Help support, particularly though, young leaders. Um, give them platforms to speak, help foster their development, um, give them opportunities. I was able to become a publications director, which shaped me. And I have had, been able to see over time the impact that I've had on so many people in little ways, just providing support, being in contact, being able to communicate with them. I hope this has helped to inspire you some too. And I wanted to end with some kind of sweeping statement that connected somehow to the title of my talk. I don't have one, so I'm going to make one. All right, I got one. <laughs> yeah, if the title is We Are Young, Let's Set the World on Fire, which is a reference to a fun song, which is on the radio a lot. All right, help to Let's all help to provide the fuel so that people can continue to set the status quo on fire and change the world.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>